Don't you just love saying that? Oh, yeah. it's seven. You understand what that is? That's yeah. good. That's good news to tell to the nation. Yeah. I have a better one. Happy oh, nobody hears that. Go ahead. Happy seven. Happy seven. Yes. It is good to be uh, with you this morning. Let's, let's pray. No, I'm not good to you. I'm a big one with, uh, I love you. Anybody else who loves you with me? I think that all of a sudden it happens. Oh, music. Why do we love music so much? Because it's a story that we it's a story that we can sing when you put melody into that story all of a sudden there's no life in it isn't there but we sing hymns that are very familiar to us and sometimes I think we just sing those familiar words and forget the message in there and did you just do that with this human just said, did you catch the message? And I said, listen to this again. We have a story to tell to who? To the nations. That's everybody, isn't it? What is that story that shall turn their hearts to the right? The wrong to the right. A story of what truth and mercy, the story of peace, of peace, of peace, of peace, of peace, of peace, story of peace, of peace, that the world, that the nations can have today. That's what you just said. So I don't have to do the message now. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, uh, ooh, I feel a little bit overwhelmed right now. I know I don't have to ask for your spirit to fill me or to fill anybody else in this place with an extra measure of your presence because your presence is here in full. Father, just open me to you. Open us to your presence and to, to be in tune with your spirit because I know that you have a message for me, for us. And Father, when we get to that point of the message with what you want each one of us to individually learn, let's feel your spirit tap on the shoulder and say, This is for you and for me. This is what I want you to do. Oh, I ask to see Jesus live. Amen. So we're going to be talking about stories. Stories, they come in all kinds of shapes, and forms, sizes. And what do we do with stories? Don't we tell them to each other? Isn't that part of our communication? Every culture in the world has stories. All of our lives, we've heard stories. Every day, pretty much all day. It's made up of hearing and telling of stories. I'm not sure that it's possible for us to have a conversation. Yeah, there could be stories involved in it. We couldn't have purpose this morning without stories being told. Now, some of them were jokes and the silly stories, but uh, I will 
will tell you where they took place, but, but then it came from Danny. <laughs> <laughs> we entertain ourselves with uh, documentaries, biographies, novels, some fiction, some nonfiction, and whether we listen to or read or watch those stories, whether we mean for them to not, they have an effect on our life. They seem to kind of draw us in to this. So or you've ever been reading an exciting novel and you just read a chapter at night before you go to bed. You know, you're huge toward the end of the novel and man, I, I know I gotta get up early in the next morning. I gotta see what happens. And so you read and all of a sudden it's midnight. It just kind of overtakes us, draws us in to that story. So much so that it can dominate our lives. We talk about it. We interact with others because of what we've read or heard or watched. It can even affect how we dream about our, what we're going to do, what we're having, what we're wanting to achieve, how we live our lives. Stories have that much effect on us. And what happens is that we can so easily base and build our lives on stories that might not be that Stories that might flat out be false. Stories that are founded on all of that is founded on stories that we read, that we hear, that we watch, and that we share. Now, if stories have that much influence, on you and me. If they can affect our lives that much, if our lives, our relationships are really based somewhat on stories, wouldn't it be a good idea for those stories to be accurate? In other words, to not be based on falsehoods. <laughs> So that we don't come to the wrong conclusions. So that we don't get down the road of life and say, how did I get here? Missing the information, even just little tidbits of information that might be false, errors in communication can lead to disastrous results. This is from an actual ad that I didn't read, I just read about from a classified ad of an old newspaper. The first day for sale, R.D. Jones has one sewing machine for sale, phone 958 after 7 p.m. And ask for Mrs. Kelly, who lives with him cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but maybe that woman, Samaritan woman at the well, maybe her name was Mrs. Kelly. <laughs> the story started going around the town about this relationship. So the next day, there was a correction that read. We regret having aired in R.D. Jones' ad yesterday. It should have read one sewing machine for sale, cheap, phone 958 3030. And ask for Mrs. Kelly, who lives with him after seven. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't help the stories flying around. Why not? 
You have seen his activity in your life. What he's done is circumstances that you have faced, your experiences, that's his glory. We have seen his glory. That's your story. That's your experience. The glory of the one and only Son of God who came from the Father's fullness and truth. We have a story to tell. It's the story of grace. Grace and truth that we've experienced in my life. Grace and truth that you've experienced in your life. It's not for us to be selfish about and hold on to. It is given to us to pass through us to those that we never had to do. That is the story we have to tell. So, why is this so important? The story of God's grace, you know it, is amazing. It, it, it's one of those when you just sit still and you, you think about it, you just kind of, wow. And that's just so amazing. What is amazing is something that's it's hard to comprehend. It's overwhelming. It feels us. This story of grace, God's grace, being amazing, you all know it, and it's an accurate truth. Why? Because you are experiencing that truth. Because, you're, because it is your story. God's amazing grace to save me. It's that that breaks through the penalty and the power and the presence of darkness of sin in my life, in your life, in this world, so that we can and will abide with Him now and forever. This is amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he brings us salvation, brings salvation to a sinner. And me too often offended, but it's true, he brings salvation to a sinner. And brought that and is continuing to bring Transformation, making us more and more to say that's the story that we have to tell. It's a story of a great Savior. We're going to be using a scripture that you might not think of too much in connection with this, but we're going to be looking at Titus this morning. Specifically in, in uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And I'm going to just break it down as I just will go through it. But the first thing we're going to see is that the story of our great Savior is that he is a, he's great in his graciousness. Verse 11 For the grace of God has appeared. That's what? Appear. It's been, it's not imagined. It's been made visible. It's been made clear. It has appeared. And what is it that's appeared? It is grace. But where does that grace come from? It's God's grace. The grace of God has appeared. How can that not affect our life? How can that not affect your life? So how does that happen? It's because of God's graciousness. Now Titus, Titus was a, a Gentile man. Um, 
The Gentile man that uh, heard the apostle Paul tell the story of Jesus. Tell the story, the gospel story, the good news story of Jesus. He heard Paul's spill and Titus received. And it changed his life. We also know that Titus took God's call then and took it very seriously because he was willing to leave everything behind. Why? To go along with Paul and to what? To tell the story of God's amazing grace. It wasn't Paul's grace. It wasn't Titus's grace. It was God's grace. God's amazing grace. So who did they tell it to? Who was that grace for? Well, let's finish the verb. It is offered to all people. Did you get that? All Not just a chosen few, all people. By far, the greatest story of history is the story of God's amazing grace. Now, you've heard the definitions of what grace is. You've heard, probably heard God's riches at Christ's expense, God's giving us what we do not deserve. Unmerited favor of God. But grace, grace helps us to realize that a right standing with God does not depend on who I am, it doesn't depend on who you are. It totally depends on you. Jay Vernon McGee tells a story of a man who wanted to join a, a local Baptist church. The deacons were unsure of his character and they began to ask him questions. Uh, questions like uh, that was regarding uh, his personal salvation. So they asked him, How did you get saved? And his answer was, God did his part, and I did my part. Well, that sounded a little fishy. So they wanted to dig in a little bit more than that. And they asked him, well, what was God's part? And what was your part? And he said, God's part was the saving. My part was the saving. I ran from him as fast as my sinful heart and other slaves could take me. But he ran after me until he made me. That is amazing grace. That God is so gracious to us that even when we were running from him as fast as our sinful hearts and rebellious slaves can take us, God wants us. And Saves That is just gracious. Secondly, in that same verse, verse 11, we find that the greatest is goodness. Now, the people were free that Titus was called to tell the story to. Well, they were, uh, shall we say, that they weren't the uh, classes. In fact, in those days, if you were called a Christian, it was a great insult. They were had a, a terrible reputation. They were known for being liars and cheats and gluttons and drunkards and being unfaithful and untrustworthy. Now, this is the story of God's amazing that it wasn't the goodness of those folks because they didn't have it. It wasn't the goodness of those folks that 
qualify them for God's grace. So what's the name of it in that hopeless case? It was totally 100 percent the goodness of God. God's amazing grace given, poured out, even though they didn't deserve it. You've probably heard me the same now. A number of times I've, I've heard it quoted. We're going to look at it again here. Your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. That's good to know, isn't it? Because we experience those worst days. But our best days are never so good. That you would have done the need. Salvation is not a matter of how good you are, of our of my goodness, Lord, but it is God's goodness that allows us to experience God's grace. This is. Continuing on the next chapter in Titus, this is a good, good picture of what I'm trying to say to you. So Titus 3, 3 through 7. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice, as wickedness, meanness. And envy, being hated, and hating one another. But, don't you love that word, but the other side of the coin is coming. Here comes the other side. But with the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared. What was the result? When he appeared, he saved. Not because of righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing, the rebirth, and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. When we poured out, poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Why? So that. Having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs of the living spirit. We have this story to tell. It's your story. It's my story. It's our story of how great a God we have. Going back to Titus 2. Verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self control upright in godly lives in this present age. When was that? Now, in this present age. To do what? To say no to ungodliness to worldly to its self-control upright in our lives. Do you need that? Does our world need people like that? Yeah. Does the world need to hear that? We don't do that anymore. We remind it of this morning. I think too many Christians think of victory in Jesus. Is something that will happen once they get up to heaven. And yes, that will be victory, total victory. But victory in Jesus is what every one of us needs to hear now. It's what every one of us needs to experience now. Victory in Jesus. How do we have that? 
because of God's word. That's the story we have to tell. Henry Blackberry describes grace as grace seeks to help people reach their potential. Grace does not condemn those who have not arrived. Grace focuses on solutions, not just the problems. Grace is the lubricant that eases friction in our relationships. Grace celebrates success and keeps no records of wrongs. This is the story. Through God's sanctified grace, making us holy, set apart, we are separated not only from sin, but into a living, loving, active relationship with God Lord Jesus Christ that begins to make us live less like the world and more. Was it Jesus prayed in John 17, 17? I think that, that chapter is the should actually be called the Lord's Prayer. Because it's uh, a chapter where he's praying for his disciples and he's praying for us. It is actually his prayer for me. It's his prayer for you. And part of that, I think it's verse 17, is praise, sanctify them. <coughs> sanctify them by the truth. What is true? I am the way. True. No man comes to the Father except Jesus is the truth. There was a Methodist doctor and a missionary. His name was E. Stanley Jones. And uh, he uh, had a mission in India. And uh, this is something that he wrote. The early Christians did not say in this name, look what the world is going to But in July, look what has come to the world. They saw not merely that sin did abound, but that grace did much more. On that assurance, the pivot of history swung from blank despair, loss of moral worth, fatalism, to faith and confidence. To faith and confidence that at last sin had met its match. We had our story to tell. The story of his gracious, the story of his goodness, and it's his great story of godliness. Looking at Titus 2, verse 13. While we wait for this blessed hope, for the blessed hope, what is that? It's the appearing in the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a fantastic story to tell. Blessed hope. It belongs to every child of God and it focuses our attention on the truth. Not errors, not things that have to be corrected, not falsehoods, but on truth. Truth that we will see our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will continue. Be no more tears, no more, no more pain, no more having to have a hip replacement. That's just the best that we have. It gives us strength and confidence to 
to live our lives with purpose and with meaning. A better day is coming. In his book, Winning Life's Toughest Battles, psychologist Julius Singer told about 25,000 American soldiers who were held in fewer conditions during the World War II. Some of them died. But a lot of them survived. There was no reason to believe that there was a difference between the stamina between those two groups. But there was one major difference between them. Those who survived were ones who held on to the hope that they would someday be leaders. They talked about jobs they would have. They talked about the kind of person that they would marry, the homes that they would build. They even went as far as drawing pictures on the walls of their souls. Just to illustrate you, my dear, of the dreams. Sigmund goes on to say that the researchers have found that that hopeful attitude that they had can also lead to psychological changes that improve our immune system and how our body fights off disease. That's hope. It's what it can naturally do to our bodies. But knowing we have this hope in the period, in the period, the God and Savior Jesus Christ. It does not lead us to sit back in our pajamas and wait for the Lord like children waiting for Santa Claus on Christmas morning. This blessed hope it leads, it motivates, and it encourages us to live lives for His honor, for His glory, and to live them now, to live them today. Aren't you thankful that? Our hope isn't built on political leaders or political system. Amen. That our hope is not built on never having any problems or on winning the lottery. The difference between this world's hope and biblical hope is that the world that hope is unsure. This worldly hope is unsure of what it even hopes for. It was on the right person's country. I hope it doesn't bring the check to me and wash out my playtime. I hope I make more money next year. Unsure things. Biblical, biblical is being sure of what it is hope that hope is based on. And it is based upon God's promises. I've tried to get our church, and some of them do it for a number of years now. I found the practice of while I'm reading the scriptures, and every time I see God say, I will. Jesus say, I will, I will do it like that. And you'd be amazed as you look through my Bible how many underlines there are throughout all of his words. What are those? There are promises. I will, God said, I will make that promise. But God has given us. And if you go back and do an extensive study of it, you'll never find any place that God didn't fulfill a promise. Now, some of them are still to come, but we can trust His I will, His promise. What is the whole? The whole biblical Bible or dictionary is on it. Defines blessed hope as this trustful expectation or 
particularly with reference to the fulfillment of God's promises. Biblical hope is the anticipation of a favorable outcome of God's promise. It continues. More specifically, hope is the confidence that what God has done for us in the past guarantees our participation in what God will do. This contrasts to the world's definition of hope as a feeling that of something that might happen. <laughs> Titus 2 3, 13. While we wait for this blessed hope, the purity of the glory of that great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us, redeem us of all wickedness. To purify for yourself a people that are for his That's another good thing that I right there. He is very only eager to do what is good. When you truly begin to understand what God has done for you. It will motivate you to serve the Lord with a fresh passion. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. It's easy for the world to weigh on our shoulders and to make us forget. When Jesus told his disciples that he would sin, ask the Father to send the counselor. What did he say that counselor was supposed to do? It's going to teach. It's also going to remind you of what you've already been taught. Sometimes we need that reminder. We have a story to tell. And it is the greatest story to be able to tell. That story is. Well, I was stuck in the mud, stuck in the mud of trapped in his darkness and sin. God came and ran me down. He brought me rescue. He gave me hope. This is the story that God's going to bring salvation. Salvation that leads us to a total transformation of our lives and in this world. Jesus paid the ultimate price, laying down his life for you, for me, for us. What happened now free us to live with new life? His passion and purpose into you. Eager to do what is good. We have a story to tell. It's a story of victory that we have in Jesus Christ. A victory that is not just for us and us alone. It's a victory for this world. And it is for us to be eager to do what is good. That is the story we have that God has given us to tell. Father, we thank you again for this amazing business. If I look back on my life, So many times uh, I, would, I just ask, what did you see there? You keep running after me no matter how far I was going. And I think that's never one of the stories. I would use your spirit right now. Did you 
Christ in us because we have, as the promise gave us, because we have accepted your son. You have placed your spirit in us. I hope right now to take that spirit out of that closet and put it in all the things you That spirit should remind us. How much you have done for us. You remind us of the story that you have given us to tell. Not to hold on to just for my own personal records, but a story to tell to the world. To those that are around me, my family, my co workers, my classmates. Those that we meet in Walmart. That's the story you have given us to tell that it is a story of faith. That because Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. We'll turn in the hymnals to 426 victory in Jesus. <laughs> 